I call the Honourable Peter Dunn. Mr Speaker, in this morning's newspaper there was an announcement that New Zealand scientists had discovered a series of planets that float independently through the solar system. I think in listening to the responses from parties opposite this afternoon, we have discovered some of those planets, because the arguments that they advance really bear no relationship at all to contemporary reality. Let's just take a few moments to reflect upon those. The first is that since 2007, the world has been going through the greatest economic crisis since the Great Depression. It is no coincidence that Northern Hemisphere economies are deeply in debt, that the American economy is on its knees, that New Zealand has had its share of shocks. And to try and suggest, as parties opposite do, that somehow those events have no impact on New Zealand's situation today is utterly fanciful. And then you add in two major earthquakes in Christchurch in the last few months both of which by international standards have been highly significant in terms of the costs that they have imposed physically, emotionally, socially and financially on the people of Canterbury and on the country as a whole, and the government's responsibility to make good that physical damage at best it can. It has to pay, Mr Speaker, for those moves, and it does so in this budget. And it is sheer folly and ignorance and stupidity to say that somehow those figures have no impact on the state of our budget and the state of our books today. But, Mr Speaker, I think what most people looking at this, at this budget will conclude is simply this. Most New Zealand households know that when times are tough, you make adjustments to your budget to reflect your circumstances. You do not go looking for the Labor money tree at the back of the garden because it's not there. And nor do you go and burn everything down in the hope that by destroying the village the way Dr Brash would, you can rebuild it. You make prudent, wise adjustments, a little bit of adjustment here, a little bit of adjustment there, but fundamentally enabling you and your family to get through the difficult circumstances and to look forward to a positive future. And that's exactly what this budget has done. Now, before the budget, there was a huge amount of hue and cry about changes to KiwiSaver and about a return to the days of uncertainty in terms of retirement savings provision. In fact, Mr Speaker, the changes announced today are minimal. They have a big fiscal impact, but in terms of individual savers and the certainty around the scheme, they are minimal. And it's worth reflecting on why they've arisen. Very simply, KiwiSaver has exceeded everyone's expectations in terms of its success. It was originally projected to have 700,000 members by 2015. In 2011, it's double that, more than double that, at 1.7 million members. And you cannot therefore acknowledge that somehow there's no additional fiscal cost to the government because of the member tax credit and the kickstart and the other provisions that the government provides as part of the scheme. And so what the government has had to do quite prudently is say to secure the sustainability of KiwiSaver for the future, we need to make some adjustments that will have a significant fiscal impact but will not deter significantly the level of saving that's going on. And that's precisely what has happened. Come back to my household analogy. It's exactly what a household would do in similar situations. I happen to believe that the government could go further. I strongly favour KiwiSaver being made a compulsory national savings scheme, and I believe that will happen eventually, because I think that then locks in absolutely the security and the future of the scheme and is really what most New Zealanders are looking for, and it then enables us to have a much more balanced approach to the whole question of retirement saving and long-term provision in the future. Mr Speaker, much was made of the projected changes to the Working for Families regime. Again, sir, a scheme that far exceeded expectations from the time of its introduction in 2004. It has been successful. It has delivered uplift to a number of families, and that's good. But the reality is it's also come at a cost. And I don't think that any of the original authors of that scheme would have acknowledged then 
that the flavour of the scheme would be as it was today. And so there are issues that do need to be addressed. We started in the budget last year with addressing some of those issues around the definitions of income for eligibility for working for families tax credits. In this budget, the Minister quite prudently makes some adjustments to the abatement rate and to the question of those people who have children over the age of 16. Mr Speaker, the time frame for their implementation over the next eight years suggests a very modest impact for most people, but again, a significant fiscal uh, positive for the Crown. So, Mr Speaker, I think when one looks at the overall context in which the budget is performed, uh, you, you would have to conclude, or one would have to conclude, that this is very much a budget for the times. But, Mr Speaker, that's not to say that there were not things that could have been included in the budget. I welcome the additional spending that's going into the health sector. I particularly welcome the $80 million more going into the provision of medicines. That's going to see another 32,000 people get access to the medicines that they need. And on top of the funding advanced in the previous two budgets, means that somewhere in the order of 270,000 New Zealanders now will get more access to medicines than they would have at the time that this government came into office. And so I think that's a tremendous achievement and will be beneficial for a significant number of people who rely on medicines to maintain a good quality of life. But Mr Speaker, in terms of health, though, I think the next big change we need to start to address is in the area of prevention. And I believe very strongly when we're spending around eight to nine hundred dollars a day keeping a person in a public hospital, that we ought to be moving over time to a free annual warrant of fitness health check, initially for over 65s, but ultimately for everyone in the population, because prevention and the level of expenditure up front to achieve that is far better and far more cost effective than the cure further down the track. Now, Mr Speaker, a lot was said in and around the budget and in the speeches today about cracking down on those people who do not pay their fair share. Well, Mr Speaker, I reject the arguments raised implicitly, because he didn't say it explicitly, by the Leader of the Opposition about tax increases. But I want to tell the House what was the outcome of the additional funding advanced to inland revenue last year to crack down on tax avoidance, tax evasion and people who were uh, simply failing to pay their tax on time. Last year's budget put in place approximately $120 million over a four-year period to put more effort into that a particular area of activity. It's already returned $115 million in additional revenue in just nine months. So, Mr Speaker, we're getting about 13 per cent more than we expected. We're somewhere between five and eight times the amount invested being returned in the amount collected. And that's sending some very clear signals about tax avoidance, tax evasion in New Zealand and the government's intolerance and proper intolerance to that continuing. Finally, sir, before I finish, can I acknowledge the additional funding uh, included in this year's budget for Wellington Urban Rail Services. By my quick calculation, that brings us up to about $300 million over the last few years. It's great to see the new trains running, but I want to say this to Transrail. The new trains and the new equipment have to be matched by a new attitude in terms of the delivery of service. Your passengers will increase, but they will leave you very quickly if they find surly, sloppy service not matching the quality of the infrastructure now being provided. So, Mr Speaker, overall, I think New Zealanders can feel confident that this budget is a prudent step towards managing our country's finances in a very difficult and stressful time. It does set a course for the future. It gives heart and confidence to the people of Canterbury in their hour of need, but it also gives assurance to New Zealanders of every generation that their circumstances have been protected, that their circumstances are very much forefront of the government's attention. And frankly, sir, the lack of alternatives put forward this afternoon by opposition parties leaves New Zealanders with a very clear sense of the options they face come the 26th of November later this year. I call the Honourable Minister 